Good morning. I'm sure you know by now about the devastating symptoms of an epidemic that has swept the globe. The physical effects are difficulty swallowing, dry mouth, dizziness, fast heartbeat, fatigue, headaches, inability to concentrate, irritability, muscle aches and muscle tension, nausea, nervous energy, rapid breathing, shortness of breath, sweating, trembling, and twitching, suppression of the immune system, and the list goes on. Digestive disorders, short-term memory loss, premature coronary artery, dis artery disease, and heart attack. It can also lead to depression and ultimately to suicide. It is a destroyer, a condition that is so powerful it can wreck homes, rob joy, or steal hope. What I am talking about this morning is worry. Worry can have all these devastating effects, and I would say, statistically speaking, just about one out of every one person will experience at least some of these symptoms at some point in their lifetime. So let's start here. Matthew chapter 6, verse 27 to 34. It says this, it says, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, What shall we drink, or what shall we eat, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Or as William Ralph Eng, an Anglican priest from the late 1800s and early 1900s once said, Worry is interest paid on trouble before it's due. So this morning, I'm going to be talking about how we're not supposed to worry, but easier said than done, right? As I said before, probably one out of every one of us struggles with worry to some degree, and it manifests itself in one form or another. So what should I say about worry this morning, and why should I address the subject at all? Well, let's start with this. One of the most repeated commands in the Bible, even more than the command to love, is to not fear. Stop worrying. Obviously, it is important to God that we all stop worrying. And if it is, then it's worth repeating in a morning message here at church. I brought my son Stephen to Walmart the other day, and at one point he said, Daddy, you're not going to leave me here, are you? I don't know why he said that. Maybe because we didn't bring him to the store that, you know, that often during the past year because of the isolation. Or um, maybe it's just that, you know, he wasn't used to it. Or maybe it was the size and the scope of a superstore. Maybe it was the people, you know. Sometimes I'm scared at Walmart too. I don't know. But I said to him, buddy, I will never leave you here at Walmart. As a dad, I don't want my son to live in fear. I want him to enjoy life and all it has to offer. If he has any anxiety, any doubts, any fears or phobias or hesitations in this world, I would rather he gave them to me and let me worry about them. And I think that we as adults sometimes forget that in regards to our Heavenly Father, uh, he's the same way. I'm pretty certain when thinking about it in light of my relationship with my own children, that God does not want us to walk around in a state of worry because I don't want my children to do that either. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Leo Bascaglia once said that worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only robs today of its joy. And I think that is one of the reasons that God tells us in Matthew chapter 6, 
not to worry about tomorrow. What has you worried today? As a dad, as a husband, as a human being, I worry about things. I worry about not getting work and always being stuck in a rut. And I worry about paying bills. I, I worry about that if we lose our health insurance one day, we cannot continue life-saving treatments on a couple of our medically fragile children. I worry about my kids in this depraved and ever-decaying woke culture that they're growing up in. I worry about child predators. I worry about the corruption in the highest and lowest offices of our government. I worry about this and I worry about that. And I would consider myself to be pretty emotionally stable too, yet I worry. And if Jesus was here with me right now, I think he might say, fear not, Dan. The same message I tell my own children. In other words, Jesus might say, I'll handle things. One little exercise you might want to try is to go back in time in your mind and to think about what it was you worried about way back when, and then ask yourself how things turned out. I mean, think about it. At the very least, you can say, well, I'm still alive. I survived. If I go back to when I was very little, I used to be scared of what might be under my bed or in my closet that would emerge when the lights went out. But I'm still here. The boogeyman has yet to get me. So perhaps my worrying way back then was a waste of energy and breath. It occupied too much of my brain and it robbed me of some peace. And I can do this for moments throughout my life, you know, when I, when I graduated high school and worried about losing all my friends as they ventured off to college. Or when I tried to enter the workforce and thought I would never find a job or times when I lost my job and worried about finding another one. There were times I worried about never finding that special someone to share my life with, and on and on and on. Yet, on and on and on, my needs were met. But I don't have to go back that far. I, I can think back to a year and a couple of months ago when I was stressed out about losing work and paying bills, but here I am. My wife and I, as difficult as it has been getting through all this, God has provided. So think back to those moments in your life when you worried and asked yourself, was it worth all of the nail biting, the sleepless nights and upset stomachs? Or has God been faithful? So do we, what do we you know, do about worry? Well, here are five things I've identified in scripture that we can do if we wrestle with fear. First, as our scripture tells us this morning, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When trouble arises, do we first turn to Christ? Do we seek God to carry the problem or do we place it squarely on our shoulders? I once read a biography of Abraham Lincoln when he had one particular horrible night of stress during the Civil War when it seemed he was carrying all of the death and destruction of the war on his own shoulders. And he had retired to his bedroom and he, he started off knowing he was going to have a sleepless night because he was worried so much about it. Have you ever had one of those because you just couldn't stop your mind from thinking about that, that thing, whatever it was? And you rolled it over and over and over again in your mind? Well, Lincoln was having one of those until finally he reached for a Bible that had been given to him as a thank you gift from a group of former slaves who were grateful for his Emancipation Proclamation setting them free. And the story says he read and he read scriptures until he came to peace, realizing that he could release that load he was carrying to God. And when he came down the stairs the next morning, witnesses said he had looked visibly changed. They could see peace on his face. And God wants that peace to be yours. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But second, as our passage tells us today, try not to worry about tomorrow, but just deal with what you have to worry about right now. In other words, leave behind the stuff that you have no control over or things that may never come to pass anyway. How often do we stress out about something that is in our future and out of our hands that may never happen? 
Why should I worry about our family losing our health insurance over the next year or so when A, it may never happen, and B, if it does, there is nothing I can do about it anyway now. That is a lot of emotional energy expended for no good reason. Third, be generous. Having a generous spirit can help take the spotlight off of your troubles and allow you to focus on somebody else. I remember on Christmas Day this past year, I had to stop and get gas on my way to my mother's, and I was really thirsty, and so I went into the store and in order to buy a drink, and I saw this poor kid working behind the counter. He was the only one there, and it's Christmas, and people are coming in and out, and this guy gets stuck behind the counter working on Christmas Day. I thought, I'm going to have some fun. So I told him I was on my way to see some family and I needed some snacks and I asked him what he recommended. So the worker started suggesting some snacks and food and drinks and I asked what some of his favorites were and he would tell me. So I'm walking around gathering a bunch of snacks and drinks and food and um, paying attention to what he's telling me that he thinks are you know, really good. And finally I went to the counter to pay. And I thanked him for helping me out. And when he was done ringing everything up, it only came to about $15 or so. And I took a pile, the pile of snacks and the drinks and I pushed them across the counter towards him and I said, Merry Christmas. And he said, well, this stuff is for me. It's sort of incredulous, you know. I said, yeah, I just really appreciate your, you know, you working on Christmas day and everyone else has off. And I just wanted to thank you. And that look on his eyes from behind that stupid mask we were both wearing, it was worth every penny. So be generous. In the book of Luke, chapter 12, in this passage from the Sermon on the Mount, it's the same one. It's like more of the same version of the text that I just read from the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Um, there's even more that Jesus says where he says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. In this passage on not worrying, Christ is telling us to give to others. Again, I think it's because that will help take the focus on us and what we have to worry about, be worried about and put it on someone else. I believe the next three tools we have for dealing with fear or worry, they can be found in Philippians chapter four, verses four to nine. Are you ready? Listen to this. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So number three, rejoice, praise God, worship him. This, by the way, again, takes the focus off your problems, but it also recognizes the person and the position of God during your current circumstances. I think this is why the Apostle Paul, while he was in a dark, dirty prison, Later on in the, the New Testament, he was chained to a wall. Well, he chose to sing praises to God. But it goes on. It says in verse 5, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by, and here it is, prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Well, there they are, number four and five on dealing with worry. We are to pray, which recognizes the presence of God. And we are to be thankful because it recognizes the power of God. Because you see, when we worry, we are ignoring the person of God, the presence of God, and the power of God. But check it out. Here is the promise of God in Philippians chapter four. It goes on to say, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then check out this next part where we are told what to actually expend our mental energy on. It says in verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And here's that promise once again. And the peace of God will be with you. So to recap how we should deal with our worrying, number one, seek first the kingdom of God. 
Number two, be generous and giving to others. Number three, rejoice, praise, and worship him. Number four, pray. And number five, be thankful. Have an attitude of gratitude. Friends, some of you may be feeling worried about the coming transitions and changes that will be taking place here at Farmington United Methodist Church. You may have gotten an injection of anxiety as Pastor Jeff announced his retirement. I know I did. But as we learned last week, we are part of the church, which the gates of hell will not be able to stand against. Together, we will make it through. We will miss our pastor and his wife, but we will make it through. And there will be challenges and there will be setbacks and there will be doubt and fear, but I am, I am confident in this. 10 years from now, we will look back on this day, this era of our lives in this church, and we will say, God is faithful. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are, you are um, faithful. And I pray, God, that you would be with each one of us, that you would be with our pastor, Pastor Jeff and his wife, Beth, and uh, be with them on this next season of their life. And I pray that you would be with us during this next season of our church life, that you would help the uh, teams that are involved with um, finding another pastor, that they would be successful, that you would place in this church the very right pastor that we are supposed to have. I pray that we would all contribute and use our gifts and our talents to help this church move forward. But I pray most of all, Lord, that you would give us your peace, the peace that transcends all understanding while we go through challenging times. Thank you for being our God. We know you are faithful. We ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.